bow our heads. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into your house today. Lord, we give you the praise and the honor for all that you'd accomplish in our lives. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man or from a woman, from the old or from the young. Lord, we come to hear from you, and we acknowledge that here at The Rock, it's Jesus that's the senior leader of this church. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our counselor today, would lead us and guide us, direct us, uh, instruct us in your word, Father. I thank you that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, Lord, our hearts and our minds to, to understand and comprehend your word, your will, your desire for our lives, that as we walk out of this place, we are equipped to, to take on that which you have given to us in life. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. Lord, we thank you for all the churches that are meeting all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are hearing Jesus, our preaching of Jesus today. Lord, we thank you that you would bless them. Lord, tonight, bless the Harvest Crusade. And Lord, I would just pray for much fruit with that, Lord. And many people would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior for what that church is putting on. And Lord, we thank you for that. And thank you for people that are taking a stand for Jesus all around this world. And we give you the honor in Jesus' mighty name. We all together said, Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, get your Bibles out. Go with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Whoa, 18 months in Hebrews chapter 11. Vicki McHenry, she's a, one of the wonderful ladies behind our CD duplication and CD sales counter. She emailed me a couple of weeks ago and she said, Pastor Luke, I've got all the dates written in my, uh, in my Bible. And we've been in Hebrews for six years and we have spent 18 months in Hebrews chapter 11, and here today, the last week of August, we're going to enter into a new series, a new season, a season, a series about running the race as we look at the analogy that the Bible gives to us about this great race that we are to run in our lives and what we have to understand about that today. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at verse number 1 and 2. But before we go, I'm just going to tell you a quick little story. Just kind of maybe talk about what the Bible wants, what God wants to speak to each and every one of us today. A couple of years ago, many years ago, uh, about 2001, I was in Oklahoma. We, went to, we moved to Oklahoma to go to Bible training, a Rainbow Bible Training Institute. And uh, there we were, uh, and I picked up the guitar, you know, moving 1,500 miles away from your home. You know, you didn't have satellite TV. We didn't have Netflix. didn't have the internet, any of that stuff like that. It was just really boring. So I went to a pawn shop, bought a guitar, and it's like, I'm going to just teach myself how to play the guitar. So I remember I was learning how to play the guitar, and I bought my guitar. I was out there in my living room in this uh, little town home that my, me and a couple other guys, Pastor Joe, our young adults pastor, and a couple other guys, we all rented together. And I remember I was sitting out there one day learning to play this guitar. And, you know, back in those days, you remember before, like, iPods? Do you remember before, like, uh, Bluetooth speakers? Remember before, like, earbuds? You had to go to the stereo. You know what I'm talking about? And the stereo was, like, this tall, you know? And, it had, and the speakers were even bigger than that. So I remember in order to listen to the music, you know, I had to take my cassette mixtape and, and drop it in the stereo and, and try to play it and then like try to play the guitar along to it and then rewind it. And I remember I was sitting out there one day, everybody was at work and it was just me. It was like a cold, dreary, dreary day. And I was sitting out there to make matters a little bit worse. Okay, I was sitting out there playing the guitar in my undies. All right, I know mental image you didn't want to get. But... So there I am, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just there, I'm, in the, I'm in, the, in the rhythm, I'm just playing the guitar, and I'm feeling it, trying to learn the song, and I'm just, I'm just expressing myself, right? That's what musicians do, okay? And uh, all of a sudden, I just got this really weird feeling, this just uncomfortable, kind of like, ugh, like, just the hair starts standing up on the back of my neck, kind of feeling just like, what is going on? So I'm like, just shaking it off, like, okay, you know, just get into it, just playing the guitar. And un unbeknownst to me, my, my roommate at the time had gotten off work a little bit early, and he saw that I was uh, home alone, and he thought it would be a really good idea to go walk around to the backyard and stand in the window and just stare at me until I noticed him. So there I am, I'm just playing, and all of a sudden I get that weird feeling, like, <laughs> like just what, you know, just... And then I look up, and out of the corner of my eye, I just see the figure of a person staring at me at the window. And I'm like, ah! you know, and just jumped off and ran into my room and put my clothes on, you know. And he just, he comes back in, and he's just like, dude, I got you. Oh, my gosh. You got you. And I'm just like, bro, never again. <laughs> you've probably been there before, too, where you've had that feeling that somebody was watching you. What is it about that that you can sense, that you can feel 
that eyes are on you, that somebody's watching you when you don't even know who it is. I remember I was doing some research on the subject this last week, and I had read that a university had done the study about, about that sensory kind of idea, and they said that uh, uh, the overwhelming statistic of humans believe that somebody is watching them even when nobody is. And they did this study where they took a person and they put sunglasses that didn't have any, uh, you know, they were, you couldn't see through them, and they just asked the person, are they looking at you or are they not? And, and overwhelmingly, people said, they're looking at me. Why? I think we err on that side of caution. Maybe you've been on the job, and, and the supervisor came, and they leaned over your shoulder to see what you're doing. Or maybe you were doing something at home, and the kids wanted to watch what dad was doing or what you were working on. Or maybe you were just in a conversation, and across the room, you noticed that somebody was watching you talk. And there's just something unnerving about the idea of being watched by somebody else. And what is it that creates that unnerving uh, sense in, 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 uh, in us? I think it's the pressure. It's the pressure that we put on ourselves when we're being watched to, to not mess up, to not make that ugly face that m maybe somebody's waiting for, to, to not say what somebody's waiting for you to say, to not do what somebody, you know, the pressure to perform. You know, somebody's staring at you and you think like, what, do I got something in my teeth? Do I got a bug? What, what is the, why are you looking at me? Stop looking at me. Nobody likes to be watched. You think about it, even the star celebrities and the, the massive athletes that are used to the pressures uh, of being watched by crowds of people. They're used to the spotlight being on them. But when you take that spotlight and you shine it into somewhere else in their life, oftentimes they collapse. Oftentimes, like Larry was talking about Tori, just standing flat-footed. Oftentimes they shy away and they say, get out of my personal life. We just don't like to be watched. There's this pressure involved in being watched. And when we read verses like we're about to read today, oftentimes I believe these verses can put a lot of pressure on us, and I want to shed some light and some clarity onto what the Bible has to say about you and I in our walk with God. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about this subject of running the race and what the Bible says about this metaphorical idea of our race to run and, and what we ought to do and some great illustrations and some great examples of what we ought to do. But Let's look at these verses that we're going to look at in the next couple of weeks and, and, and just see what God wants to speak to us today. Verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that was set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it's a great statement. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the subject of running the race. But today, I want to focus in on that very first part of what Hebrews chapter 12 has to say to you and has to say to me. And it says that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The reality that we have to live with every day of our lives is the reality that heaven is watching you. I don't know about you, but I grew up all my life a little bit unnerved by that idea. I mean, to think about it for a moment. They're watching me. I don't know about you. I'm sure you're just like me and the fact that you're human and that you've said things that you didn't want to say and that you've done things that you know you shouldn't have done, that you've acted in ways that you know you shouldn't have acted, you've made decisions that you know you shouldn't have made, and just to think the idea that heaven is watching what you're doing just gets a little bit unnerving. What is it all about, that pressure of, I don't want to mess up, and, and there's people watching me, and, and I get this image of, like, Raphael's painting of these, these cute little chubby cherub baby angels sitting on a cloud watching my life, and, and, and they're going to go tell Jesus about what I've just done. And the pressure to perform oftentimes just becomes this debilitating idea in our lives that says, man, I just don't know if we can do it. Then you take that idea. Heaven is watching. Okay, that's enough right there. But then think about what Jesus had to say in the Gospels. Jesus started talking about your thoughts and the intentions of your hearts. Jesus started talking about understanding. The Bible tells us that the word divides uh, the thoughts in the, in the flesh of men. It's so now all of a sudden we understand that heaven is watching, but not only are they watching our actions, heaven is watching your heart. Heaven is watching your thoughts. Talk about pressure. You better not mess up because everybody's watching you. 
I'll tell you what, growing up as a pastor's son, everybody wanted to know if Pastor Jim was really living what he was preaching. And how do you tell if a pastor's living what they're preaching? You look at their kids, right? Growing up, our life was a fishbowl, we used to say. Everything that we did was on public display. And we just got used to it. And now in the position that I'm at here in the church, it's like uh, the, 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 the idea of being watched. I can't go to the supermarket in my favorite sweatpants anymore. Because somebody's watching me. Just a couple of days ago, uh, right here at church, we were having a, a practice for the music team. And one of the music stands on the stage fell over and landed right across all my toes. The big black broad part of the metal just guillotined all my toes. And I, I screamed out and, and I went back into the video room off to the back of the side of the stage and I took my shoe off. Instantly my toes are all black and I text Stacy. She was sitting right out here and I said, babe, I think I broke my toe. So she runs up to me into the video room. You know the first thing she asked me? The first thing she asked me was, are you okay? The first thing she asked me was this, babe, did you cuss? <laughs> pressure, pressure of being watched. Of course, I told her, my love, I am redeemed of the Lord God most high and I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. But heaven knew my thoughts. The pressures of being washed, watched sometimes can be debilitating. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't, want to, I don't want to step out. I don't want to fail when everybody's looking at me. So I just shy away. I just let me go hide in a dark corner in life. As a matter of fact, David the psalmist said this. In Psalms 139, David said, where can I, where can I run from your spirit? Where can I flee your presence? If I go to the depths of Hades, you're there. If I, if I go to the, the, to the heavens, you're there. Wherever I go, God, you are there. Is there anywhere I could go that I'm, not a, that I'm not alone? It's like no matter what we do, you and I are always watched by heaven. And you take that idea and that unnerving idea can become unraveling in our lives. The pressure can be too much. The pressure can begin to tear us and chip away at us. But maybe, just maybe, we put a little bit too much pressure on ourselves. Maybe, just maybe, because of the fact that we don't like to be watched, we put more pressure on us than heaven is putting on us. Maybe, just maybe, that idea of being watched isn't exactly what the Bible is telling us in this moment. You see, so what we look at is we look at this idea of pressure and of being watched and to shed an understanding of what it really is to be watched, surrounded, as the Bible says, encompassed by this cloud of witnesses. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number one, it says, therefore, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Do you know in the Greek that word cloud? Do you know what that word cloud in the, in the original Greek language actually means? Does anybody know? Any scholars of the Greek? I'll tell you, it's okay. It means cloud. <laughs> that was a trick question. It means cloud. A couple of years ago, uh, some friends of ours, they had, bought, they had got some hockey tickets. They bought some tickets. They knew I liked hockey. And they said, hey, we, we, gotta, we got tickets to the Ducks game down in Anaheim. We want you to come. So we're like, cool, you know, like, let's go see a hockey game. So we show up to the will call window to pick up our tickets. And as we get our tickets, we see the price on the ticket stub. They were $10 tickets. If you've ever been to a professional sporting event, now I'm not talking about like, you know, minor league or anything like that. You can get cheap tickets on minor league games. I'm talking about the pros, the big leagues, the big dogs. Like a $10 ticket, it's not going to get you much, right? So there we go. We go to the Anaheim Pond and we're there. And we show the guy our tickets and he looks up, right? Like, you know, like generally in the auditoriums, like, Section one, whatever, 100, whatever is like floor level, right? And section two is like the second floor and three, four. We were like section 11. Like, he's like, you guys are up there. See that, see that, see that ladder? You got to climb the ladder. <laughs> so we go, we get our cardio on, working up those stairs. We find our seats. Sure enough, we are in the final last row of the Anaheim Pond. Now, people oftentimes complain about hockey that they can never watch hockey because it's too hard to see that little black puck on the TV. I couldn't even see the players in the auditorium. 
What do you call those seats? You call those the nosebleeds, right? When you go to the auditorium and you get that last seat, you're in the nosebleeds. Why? Because you're so high up that the barometric pressure of the auditorium is going to dry out your nose and give you a bloody nose. Contextually, here in the Bible, this first century church, they were very familiar with the Olympic Games that you and I, similarly to what you and I know today. See, the Olympics originated almost 700 years before Jesus ever came to this earth. And they lasted until 1500 A.D. So they were familiar with the tribes of Greece and the tribes of their nations gathering together for special occasions to have these massive events where they would run on their feet or foot races and they would have relay races and they'd throw the javelin and the shot put and they would, they would race their horses and they would have all these different games to show who was the best and the, the greatest athlete of that time and they'd give them a laurel wreath crown, the same type of crown that Caesar would wear, a victorious crown. So they were very familiar with this and so when they would take the ticket to that great event when they would take their ticket to that great arena that, that they had built in their area, in the areas of Corinth and Athens and so forth and so on, and they'd show it to the usher, the usher would look at that ticket and they would say, ah, your seat is in the clouds. Contextually what he's saying is, you and I, we are encompassed by a great cloud or clouds, uh, and a lot of the new, new translations say crowds of witness. The idea that is being painted here is that you are being watched by a stadium filled to capacity all the way up to the nosebleeds. Every seat is full watching you. I thought you said this was encouraging, Pastor Luke. But it says this word, and this is where it's really important for you and I, as the author of Hebrews, the Bible doesn't specify who it is, the author of Hebrews tells us and clearly paints this picture of this great race. And, and I thought the same thing I'd like to do. I had my, one of my friends, my graphic designer, I said, man, I, I want you to just to, to show me some artistic. I want you to paint me a backdrop of a race. And so this is my friend Shane Parker drew that up, drafted that, drafted that up, and just gave me some artistic. And just like how we have this artistic idea of a race Hebrews is painting this metaphoric picture for you and I, this great event, packed out stadium of heaven, watching you and watching me run this race of our lives that God has set before us. But the important terminology that we need to understand about what Hebrews is sharing right here is the word witness. Because you think about what happens when you and I go to a sporting event. What do we do? Well, we buy a ticket, we find our seat, we sit down. We get that popcorn or we get those peanuts or whatever the tradition is and, and we, we cheer on the team or we boo the team or whatever it might be. We, 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 we spectate, we watch this great event. And so when we take our cultural concepts and we take our understanding, undoubtedly that's what's being painted for us. But the Greek word here used for witness is not a sporting term of spectator. The word here used for witness is a legal term. It's the same word that we get in the English language, martyr. And what is a martyr? A martyr is a witness. What is a witness in legal terms? A witness is somebody who has seen something and shows up to do something. What? To testify of what they have seen. Oh, great. Pastor Luke, this crowd of witnesses is going to go tell Jesus everything they've seen. No. No. It says, therefore, we also. Now, oftentimes, we think of that when it says we also. We think that we also are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. But when you look at this verse in every other modern translation, it, that we also is placed in a different way. Why? Because of the context of what's being said. It says it like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, we also should run the race that was set before us. See, they're not spectating your life. They're testifying to something. And they're not testifying to what they have seen. They're testifying to what they have done. This crowd that is watching you is not spectating your life. This crowd that encompasses your life, this stadium filled to capacity in heaven that is viewing what you are doing did not show up to get that bag of popcorn when you're about to say what you know you shouldn't say. You don't have the crowd going like, oh man, look at this, get this, get ready, this is going to be good, he's going to mess up. That's not what they're there for. This is a crowd of witnesses, a crowd of people testifying to what they have seen. What have they seen? This is a crowd of people 
who have run the race and have finished and are now in the bleachers, now in the stadium, filled to capacity, watching your life, testifying, witnessing, proclaiming to you and to me, we have run our race in faith and so can you. They're cheering you on. That's what's happening to you and to me. The pressure that we put on ourselves of being watched, of being spectated, of every move, every thought, every action that we do, that heaven is recording. The Bible says that we will die and face judgment. But this crowd is a crowd of people who have gone before us. That's why it says, therefore. Why? Because that verse belongs to Hebrews chapter 11. It's predicated, it's built upon Hebrews chapter 11. What is Hebrews chapter 11? The hall of faith, the people that ran their race and succeeded in life. And it says, therefore, because they did it, now they fill the auditoriums of heaven watching you, shouting to you, we did it, so can you. So can you. You can do it. You can make it. It's what they shout to you and I. They testify to their lives. So often we think that this image of, of a disappointed God that views us in our lowly conditions, in our states of, uh, of constant messing up, in our constant saying the wrong things and thinking the wrong things and doing the wrong things. Like Paul the Apostle said, oh, what a wretched man that I am. So often we think that this is a God who views us with his spectators of heaven, disappointed in the fact that we can't seem to get it right. But you know what Hebrews tells us as we read in chapter 11? Hebrews chapter 11 showed us the life of Abraham. It showed us the life of Sarah. It showed us the life of Jacob. It showed us the life of Joseph. It showed us the life of Moses. It showed us the life of Joshua and Caleb. It showed us the life of Rahab. It showed us the life of Gideon and of Samson and of Samuel and the prophets. And one thing that we can realize and we can recognize about all the people that are recorded in the, the, the hall of faith, these titans that we look up to in life, is that they are just like you, people. That they made mistakes, that they said stupid things, that they fell on their face flat before God, but yet they picked themselves up and they kept running the race. They kept going and they kept going and they kept going and they kept going and they finished their race and now they get to sit in the grandstands of heaven to watch you and to watch me. And you know what they get to do? They get to put on their number one fan shirt. They get to break out their foam fingers and they get to watch your life and they get to say, we did it, so can you. We did it, so can you. You can make it, you can make it, you can make it. You can be that mom that you got, God's called you to be. You can be that husband that God has called you to be. You can be that boss or that employee that God has called you to be. You can be that man or that woman that God has called you to be. You don't think you can do it, but we made it, and you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And they're shouting, and they're doing the wave, and they're saying, you can make it in life. So now that pressure that we put on ourselves begins to melt away and becomes motivation to do what God has called us to do, to run the race that he has set before us. My daddy always used to teach us at this church, all my life I grew up, daddy always used to say it like this, you'll only go as far as you're encouraged. And the beautiful thing is, is that God didn't set you up for failure, God set you up for success. And you're going to be encouraged. Who are you encouraged by? The legions, the grandstands of heaven, the people that have gone before shouting in your favor, saying, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Look, hey, I messed up, but I did it. You messed up. You can do it too. Get up, wipe the dust off your feet, and keep running the race. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. If you've fallen down, you've tripped up in life, you think that you've made too many mistakes, it doesn't matter about where you've come from, it's all about where you're going, that's why we're going to talk in a couple of weeks about keeping our eyes on Jesus. I love, just a couple of weeks ago we had the Olympics, and I was watching, my, my wife and I were like crazy Olympic fans, we like DVR'd everything, and just were like, hey, it's okay if we don't go outside of the house for two weeks, it's the Olympics, it's, it's only every four years. 
And so we were watching 10,000 meter race, Mo Farah, the, the, the runner from Britain, the expected, the, 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 the contender, the, he's coming back for a second gold medal. They said, man, nobody's going to beat this guy. Halfway through his 10,000 meter race, what happens? He falls. Race is over, done. His chance is gone to defend his gold medal. But what does Mo Farah do? He gets up. He starts running. He starts running. He starts running. People see he's gaining speed. People see that he's picking his pace back up. Everybody starts standing up, even though they're in Rio. They're shouting for this Britain. Everybody's shouting. They're doing the Mo Farah M. Everybody in the crowd's going, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And guess what happened? He went back from falling to winning the gold medal in that race. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. If you've fallen, get up. Run the race. You are surrounded, encompassed by people like you that have made mistakes, made a mess up in their life, but they got up and they finished the race that God has set before them. You can do it. Pastor Luke, I just don't know if it's possible. I just don't see how I can do this anymore. I, I'm weary. I'm tired. My race is grinding me down. In 1954, there was a young man, Roger Bannister, who lost in the Olympics, lost in the Olympics, he got fourth place. That's the worst place to get. Why? Because you're the first person that nobody remembers. Coming off the Olympic Games, got fourth place, didn't medal, didn't get anything out of it. A couple of weeks later, he decided he was going to do what everybody thought was impossible. He was going to prove that you could run a mile in less than four minutes. The record had been held at four minutes and one second for more than a decade. And everybody, psychologists, sports, uh, sports figures, all said it could not be done. And he set himself to, 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 to achieve what nobody else had done before. And a couple of months after losing the Olympics, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile and ran three minutes and 59 seconds. That's great. That's motivating. But you know what's really cool about that story? Is it took just 46 days for somebody to run faster than Roger. Why? Because he proved what was once impossible was now possible. You don't think you can do it? You've got somebody in heaven saying, that giant you're facing, he's going to come down. It's possible. That sea that you're looking across trying to figure out how you're going to get across it, it'll split. It's possible. That mountain that you need to move, I've seen it move. That, it, it, Pastor Luke, you don't understand. I'm in the twilight years of my life. I don't know. I don't understand. I'm tired of running. Yeah, there's somebody in the Bible rooting you on saying, it's possible to run faster at the end of your life than it is to run in the beginning of your life. Moses and Caleb and Abraham will tell you, you can do it. It's possible. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And the beautiful thing is, is you've been given a pedigree, a pedigree. You see, we were separated by God from sin, but God sent Jesus to die on a cross for us, to bear our sin and our shame, to adopt us into a bloodline of champions. You see, you have been grafted with the DNA of God in your body, in your life, and in your spirit. Now, the blood that flows on the inside of you, spiritually speaking, with Jesus Christ, is the blood of champions. And thus... You have an advantage coming in as the favorite to win. That's why Hebrews, the last verse of Hebrews 11 chapter, says it like this. It says, God, having provided something better for us, for you. What is that better? You see, Abraham, Moses, David, they ran their right race, but they didn't have Jesus. You and I, we have Jesus. Running your race, you can do it. Why? You've got God behind you. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And you've got Jesus Christ ahead of you. How can you lose? You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Maybe you came into this place discouraged. Maybe you came into this place distraught. Maybe you came in today ready to give up on whatever it is. Today, let me tell you, you can do it. God has set a race before you. The racetrack is not going to be easy. It's going to be a challenge. That's the nature of a race. But you can do it. And all of heaven is showing up for the race of your life, cheering you on, saying, we did it by faith. You can do it also. And you've got God. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got Jesus. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. So get up, get in the race, start running.
for what God has. If you've been falling back, the Bible tells us of our pedigree, who we are because of Jesus Christ in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. It says it like this. It says, we are not those who draw back to perdition. You see, your pedigree, your DNA, is the DNA of a champion racer. Jesus Christ has come and set the example for you which means now it's not in your blood, it's not in your DNA to draw back when you fall, but rather it's in your DNA, like Paul the Apostle says, to press on towards the upward call of Jesus Christ, to lay hold of the prize that is set before you, keeping your eyes on what God has set on your life, to not grow weary while doing good because it's in your DNA. Don't draw back, press forward, press forward, press forward. Why? You can do it. If you walk out of this place with nothing else, from what we talked about today, remember, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You say, Pastor Luke, you don't understand. I feel like I'm just garbage. I feel like I'm worthless. I feel like I've got nothing to offer in life. Don't listen to the voices that are speaking to that. Listen to the voices of heaven cheering to you right now, saying you can do it. You're a champion. You're going to make it. You're going to win. We did it, and so can you. You can make it today. And whatever God has set before you, get into the race. Keep running one step at a time. You can do it. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about running this race and what God wants for you and I in this race that he has set before us. So join with us in the next couple of weeks, but let's do this. Let's go before the Lord in prayer as we finish today. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, for those that have come into this place with a discouraged heart, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to see and you hear the cheers and the admonitions of heaven saying to us that we can make it. For those who have gone before us as examples, Lord, I thank you that we would look and fix our eyes to them and recognize that if they made it, we can make it too because we have you. And the Holy Spirit, I ask this week, that you would minister to those that need to be ministered to, but that they would recognize that they are valuable, they would recognize that they are champions, that they would recognize that through Jesus Christ, they can make it in the race that you have set before them. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have to speak to us today. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. amen. Hey, listen, before we leave today, as we wrap up, I'll let you out in just a couple of minutes. I wanna just take a few more minutes. Don't leave, don't get up. It's not time. I'm gonna let you out early. It's a miracle. Take a minute. I want to talk to you about this. Listen. You can make it. You can do it. That's a statement that belongs to Jesus. This isn't a self-help message. It's not a motivational thought for you to walk out and say, well, great, good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it up and I'm going to work a little harder. See, without Jesus, you're on your own. So the only way you and I can make it, the only way you and I can finish that race, the only way that we can succeed spiritually in life is with Jesus Christ. I want you to just take a moment, think about your life. Take a moment, reflect on where you're at. Everybody's getting up, walking around. Please give me a moment of your time. I, I promise I'll let you out. You got plenty of time. Take a moment and think about your life. What is it that makes you think you're going to make it? Because you're a good person? Because you do good deeds? Think you're going to make it because you sit in church? You think that you're right with God and that Jesus is behind you because you say a token prayer every once and again. You think that everything's good because you've got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck or you go to church and you've got a membership card. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that God's on your side? That you're one and united with Jesus Christ because you attend church, because you hope or because you think. Nowhere does it say that because you do good things. Nowhere does it say because you attend church on a regular basis. None of these things gets you in the right position, that, that adoption like we talked about into that pedigree of Jesus Christ. You see, it doesn't come because of your outward actions, because of your thoughts and your wishes and your desires. Jesus is very clear in that. In John, the third chapter, he says it like this. He says, in order to inherit, to be brought in to the kingdom of God, he says, you must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? If you think about that for a moment, our society and culture has kind of made it to be one of those things where it's like those weirdo, crazy, out of control people that are just kind of off to the left field. But can I tell you something? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. See, born again means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. God's not interested in a sense of religion. He's not interested in a set of rules to abide by. He's interested in a relationship with you personally 
with his son, Jesus Christ. That's why he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody had to teach you how to lie as a child. Nobody had to teach you how to cheat on that test. You figured that out all on your own. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us of that nature, to adopt us into his family through the acceptance of Jesus into our lives so that we could be reunited and reconnected with God. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with God. It's not about a mental ascent towards him. It's not about a carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. As a matter of fact, Jesus in the book of Revelation is speaking to his church, and he says, I know your works. I've been watching you. He says, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, if I find that you're lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. It's a shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. What he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. They'll be rejected, ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Simply put, it means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs, occasional church attendance, token prayer. You're doing some of your own thing, but doing some of God's thing. You're kind of riding the fence. Not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God. We even say it like this, Sunday Christian, casual Christian. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough today to tell you the truth. That without a wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. But that doesn't have to be the final answer for your life. That doesn't have to be the end game for your life. You see, Jesus, in that very same statement that he's talking about, he says it like this. He says, I wish that you would come to me, and I wish that you would buy gold refined by me. I wish that you would wear clothes uh, robed, uh, dressed in righteousness from me. And he says these words. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens the door, he says, I will come in, and I will dine with them, and they will dine with me, and we will be together in relationship. I believe today. All across this auditorium, even at home, watching via the live stream, wherever you're at, I believe today that the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart, inviting you, saying, will you respond? Will you open up your heart to me? Will you allow me to come and be the leader of your life? God's not after religion. He's after the relationship. I believe today there are those of you in this place that the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart right now, saying, will you come and have a relationship with me? Will you respond to that invitation? God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way into your heart. Sometimes people often say, well, if God wants me, he'll take me. He wanted you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for you and for me, for our sin. To not become like sin, the Bible says, to become sin for us. So that we can in turn accept him and live for him in our lives. Today I believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment to respond to the invitation of God in your life. Jesus says these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. He says if you deny him, he'll deny you. The decision's yours. Today I want to give you that opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together. I'll ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, today... I want to make that decision to follow Jesus. I want to respond. I feel like the Holy Spirit's asking me, inviting me into a relationship with him. And I want to respond. Pastor Luke, I, I haven't been running my race the way I should be running. Pastor Luke, I've never started my race. And, and I'm tired of getting beat up and tossed around. And I, I want to start today following Jesus. You see, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge you. You can put it right back down. I'm not here to embarrass you or call you out. I'm here to build you up. See, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. If you're not sure... The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that God's desire for you is not to walk around in the darkness, groping about, hoping that you might find the truth. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came to turn the light on in your life. And he's given the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you as his seal of approval. Do not walk out of this building today without making sure of your position and your place with God. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been pressing away like that Bible says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, if you've been leaning back, Listen, it's time for you to make that decision. I'm going to start leaning in on my race with Jesus Christ. The decision is yours and yours all over the world. I want to give you the gift of privacy all across this place. I don't want you to think about anything that's going on around you. So I'm going to ask everybody in this place if you just do me the favor of bowing your heads and closing your eyes. Take that moment as you close your eyes to shut out everything around you. And it's just you and God right now. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Is the invitation of God knocking on your heart saying, respond to me today? If that's you in just a moment with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you can respond to that invitation. 
and the decision's yours. You've had a doctor's appointment and dentist appointments today. You're here because it's a divine appointment. God wants to start something in your life, and it starts by responding to his invitation. All across this auditorium, from the front row to the back row, side to side, even at home, while watching on the live stream, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. Your day of salvation is here. As everybody focuses on their position with God, be honest with yourself. Where do you stand today? If you're not sure, you can make sure. If you're not right, you can get right. In just a moment, we'll pray a prayer of salvation. And as you pop your hand up, what you're saying is, I want to be included in that prayer of salvation today. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and we'll put it right back down, and we'll go forward together. You ready? I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, you pop your hand up. I'll see it, and we'll go forward together from there. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see that hand back there. If that's you in this place today, pop your hand up so I can see it. See that hand. All right. Anybody else in this place today? Where are you at? I see you back there. If that's you in this place today, say, man, I wonder if I should. All right. I see you. I see you right here. I see you. If that's you in this place, you say, man, I wonder if I should. The Spirit of God's knocking on your heart right now between you and God and you and God alone. If that's you, I see you over there in the front, in the center section over here. I see that hand. Anybody else in this place, you say, man, I wonder if I should. Yes, today you should. Respond to the invitation of the Holy Spirit in your life. Anybody else today? I don't want to miss you. I don't want you to miss this opportunity. It's too good for you. Anybody else today? Well, several hands have gone up. Let's just give the Lord a praise for that today. So those of you that raised your hands, here's what we're going to do. I said we're going to pray a prayer of salvation, so here's what we're going to do. For those of you that raised your hands, you listen, you know this, I know this, that every decision without action is no decision at all. Saying I want to do something without doing something is nothing. So we're going to pray that prayer together. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everybody in just a moment to stand. And if you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have raised your hand. I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle, and come meet me right here at this altar. Because we're going to pray together. We're going to change destinies together. If you raised your hand, that's you. If somebody next to you raised your hand, say, come on, I'll go with you. Or look to somebody, your family member, or your friend that brought you, and say, come on, will you go with me? And come and get out of your seat, get out of your chair. And meet me here at this altar today. We're all going to stand together. My friend Jared's going to sing a song. And if that's you today, come on. I want you to come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together wherever you're at. Front row, back row. This is your moment. This is your time. If that's you, you come and meet me right here today. Let's celebrate them and encourage them as they come. If that's you today, you come. Come and stand right here. That's you. Come on. Wherever you're at. They're coming. If that's you, this is your moment. If you responded to that invitation, come on. Keep singing, Jared. If that's you, you come. If you raise your hand, it's time to respond to God. If that's you, come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me up here. Let's change destinies together right now. All right, well, hey, you guys came. And you know what? Maybe you've had a life full of mistakes. And nobody's ever said anything to you good. But let me be the first person today to tell you, good job. Good job. Doing a good job. You're choosing life. You're choosing Jesus Christ. Making the very best decision you possibly can make. Good job. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you in this cool jean jacket? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to do a couple things with you. He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Remember I said we're going to pray that prayer of salvation. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Listen, God doesn't listen to the words of your mouth. He listens to the prayers of your hearts. It's not about reciting something after somebody else and making that good. It's about believing with your heart, confessing with your mouth. The Bible says so he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free literature. We want to hook you up. We want to get you set on the right foot for your journey, for your race. And so he's going to give you some free literature, some real easy re reading, so that you walk out of this place today. You say, what do I do next? We're going to point you in the right direction. 
And the third thing he's going to do is he's going to get you connected with somebody here. They'll pray with you today. They'll get you connected with somebody. They'll invite you to come hang out with them right before church service or right after a church service. They'll buy you a cup of coffee in our cafe or sit down for some french fries or something like that for just a couple of weeks to teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything God has for you. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my buddy, Pastor Joel.